Hi. Hello. My name is Mayoa Oladimeji. And I am Ira Chisouf. And we are Team ST. <laughs> so we're here to talk about our project, which is a fire and gas detection multi-century robot. The implementation of our project is in three stages, um, actually four stages, which is the mov robot movement, obstacle detection, fire and gas detection, and the SMS alert. So Ara will talk about the Tinkercad implementation now. So um, based on the four stages that we have, um, we um, divided like the sections for each of the um, implementations into two parts. So for the Arduino version, which is basically the same thing. So for the um, robot movement, we try to simulate the robots by um, using um, the DC motors and then the motor driver so that we can connect it um, properly without blowing up the Arduino board to the um, Arduino board. So we connected these, these are the um, right wheels. So based on our code, we can see that um, 1A, so wheels, the wheels labeled 1A are like the right wheels. So we have 1A, 1B, and they are connected to one side of the um, driver module. And um, the enable pin for this right, this right wheels is um, enable pin 1 and 2, and it's connected to pin 5, which is how it is in the code. We will talk about the code more later. And then we also have like the left wheels, which are controlled by these two wheels, and it's connected to the enable pin for this side of the wheel. And um, yeah, that's basically um, this um, how we simulated what how the um, robots would work like on Tinkercad. Then we add uh, start with detection, so we um, created like a logic to um, the, um, whether the robot will move move forward, so whether these wheels. Um, the left and right wheels will move forward or whether they can move backward or whether they can when they detect an object using these um, ultrasonic sensors whether they can they turn left or they turn right so we have two um, ultrasonic section um, sensors for the obstacle detection we have the front sensor and then the right side sensor so the front sensor is the one that is placed, supposed to place in front of the robot and um, um the robot is moving when the robot is moving forward it's what detects whether there's an obstacle in front so when there's an obstacle in front it pauses then checks the right um sensor for whether there's an obstacle on um, the right so that it can decide to go left if there's an obstacle or go right if there's no obstacle and then the next section is the fire and gas detection so because um, wanted to simulate um, the presence of a fire or um, gas leaks. We added, um, we simulated that using um, the IR remote and the IR sensor. And then for gas leaks, we simulated that using um, potentiometer. So essentially, um, if there's a gas leak, that means the threshold for the gas sensor has risen above the normal threshold for like the normal gas um, levels. So we simulated that by um, maybe like increasing or turning the potentiometer to like a particular um, value above the threshold that would set in our code then um, for the um, fire sensor um, we simulated that using the IR remote so say for example there is the presence of a fire that is simulated by um, pressing any button on the IR remote so um, the sensor um, when you press a button on the IR remote it triggers uh, the interrupt button that says that oh if um, the fire has been detected and with that we also have our uh, buzzer that um, comes on whether a, fi um, whether a fire has been detected or um, gas has been detected, like gas levels have risen. So now those, those are basically the components that we use to simulate our projects on Tinkercad and it's basically the same thing with the register version now. So we'll talk, um, like to like explain um, the code in more details. Um, my own start. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the obstacle detection and the robot movement. So from our code, so for our code here, we have um, our enable pins. That's our I use this. sorry, <laughs> true. Mm -hmm. Our enable pins um, one and two here is connected to five, and our enable pin three and four connected to six. Then our drive um, driver one a, driver pin one a driver pin one b driver pin two a two b. These are collectively sorry. I'll be respectively input one, input two, input three, and input four pins on, of our motor driver. Then we also connected, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We also connected our trig and echo pins for our front um, ultrasonic sensor to A4 and A5 and right 
sensor is connected to A1 and A2. So we also declared some variables that's um, left wheel spin, right wheel spin, front distance, and side distance. So for our robot movement, we declare we define some methods for that. Start robot is to sorry, I keep forgetting. Start robot is to enable the um, enable pins. Is <laughs> 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 to is to write the enable pins to high. Um, so we analog wrote them because we found that digital writing was too high. So we wanted to control the speed of the robot. So we set it to a particular speed. Okay. So for a stop robots, we set all the inputs to low. Um, for stop wheels, we set the um, enable pins to zero. Then for move the robot, that's for move forward. We enabled, I mean, sorry, we wrote our digital pin 1a which is input 1 to low and um 1b which is input 2 to high uh input 3 to low and input 4 to high then move backwards we did the reverse which is set our input 1 to high and our input 3 to high then the two pins we set them to low turn right this is an alternate method but we actually use this turn right with full speed where we wrote our uh, enable pins high to allow the robot turn right with full speed. Um, so we set our, our left pins, which are the input one, two. They are connected to our left wheels, sorry. Right. Set it right. to low. Is it right? Yeah. Right. Okay, to our right to low, then the left to high. That's the left forward. That's input four. So it moves it right. right. True, true, true. Okay. Then for left, we did the reverse, which was, you know, set our left wheels to low and then our right forward pin high. Yeah. Okay. That's basically it. That's basically it. So for our um, obstacle detection, it's up? Mm hmm. Yeah, for our obstacle detection, we use this method, which is basically the int trig. We passed the int trig and int echo, then we wrote this method to send out the um, the pulse and then send it back. Then we use it to calculate. Now this is the duration which we 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 got from the pulse in method. So the pulse in either reads high or low from a pin, and we're reading high from uh, we're reading the echo pin so we passed um this will be the duration in micro is basically the travel time for the pulse and we calculated the distance of the obstacle by using the distance um, formula which is equals to distance over time yeah 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 distance is equal speed, to speed time speed, time yeah. and then because you know it calculates the um journey to and fro we just need the the distance to the object so we divided it by two so and uh, now to the flow of the robot to the flow of the movement in our code first we check the front distance obstacle and we check the side distance if there's any obstacle obstacle sorry then we start the robot which is enable the you know write the enables to high then okay okay so the logic of the code is if the front distance is less than 80 that means there's an obstacle in the front of the robot so the robot stops for a bit it's delayed by 100 milliseconds it moves backwards quickly for 500 milliseconds if in the front distance if there's an obstacle there and also there's also an obstacle towards the side because the side distance will be less than 70 to right. show there's an obstacle on the right it turns left with full speed for 200 milliseconds mm -hmm. then keeps moving forward depending on the case else it turns right with full speed so yeah else if there's no obstacle at all the the robot keeps moving, moving forward yeah so would so yeah so the implementation will show the full implementation of the code later 
Okay, so continuing from like um, the obstacle detection, the next part or the next stage is the fire and gas detection and then the SMS notification. So for the, um, how we simulated um, the fire and then the gas detection, we have um, the flame of the sensor, which is being simulated by the IR sensor and the IR remote. So that um, this IR sensor is connected to the um, pin two of the Arduino board and then you can use the remote to trigger something. And then you also have a buzzer which will basically notify us if um, um, a fire has detected, in which case a button on the IR remote has been pressed. And then this buzzer frequency is just to give like a specific frequency to um, the tone of the buzzer. And then we have our gas analog pin, which is basically being simulated by the potentiometer. And that's supposed to just tell us, oh, if the, um, if the gas sensor readings are within a particular ring that is still within the threshold for the gas, um, for the normal gas levels, then there will be no tone. But if we have like, basically just connecting this A3 to the potentiometer of the Arduino board, and then we have these um, two variables to check for the last gas message time. So that's, that will come into play when we are talking about the SMS notification, sending SMS notifications. So um, for the setup, we have um, the attached interrupt pin. So because we want um, the, um, the robot to function in such a way that it runs its obstacle avoidance and movement routine, but if it does detect um, a fire, then it should interrupt that routine and then run its, um, its the routine for detecting fires or for alerting um, the user or like the homeowner for like there's a fire or stuff like that. So we um, want the flame pin to be an interrupt pin and then we want to run the, f the flame detection uh, method when it actually detects an interrupt. So, um, and then we want it to detect or to run this interrupt pin on the rising edge, which is basically if um, there is like a, if um, the value of the flame pin goes from zero to I, from low to I, then it should detect, it should pick up the interrupt and then run the um, interrupt routine. So, um, yeah, for the main part of the loop, but before we go to the main part of the loop, let's just explain um, the um, routine that is supposed to run when it, um, the pin is actually being interrupted. So that would be the um, flame detection. So um, this one was, we alter, altered this one to fit with the um, Tinkercad version, but basically what we want the flame detection um, routine to run is that it should stop the robot and then it should turn on the buzzer to alert the, um, whoever is around that there is actually a fire and then it should send a notification that, oh, fire has been detected. So this IASR robot is just to add like a delay, but it's basically stopping the robot, stopping the movement of the robot. And then we also have for the gas leak, the same thing for the gas leak, except that um, a gas leak will not interrupt the um, obstacle avoidance routine for the robot. So um, to check for gas leak, we just read um, the um, value of the analog pin and check whether O oh, it is greater than the threshold that we are setting, in which case it is 512. So our potential limiter runs from 0 to 124. And then we are checking that, oh, if the, once you turn like the gas um, for the potential meter and the value is greater than 512, then it should um, simulate the um, idea that a gas leak has occurred. So, and then you should turn on the buzzer and send an SMS notification that a gas leak has been detected. So going to the um, um, loop function, um, when you um, run your normal obstacle code and all of that, you always want to turn on the buzzer at first when the robot is moving forward because nothing is happening. And then you check for gas leak simultaneously because you also want to be running the checking um, the routine for gas leak while the robot is running its movement function. And then, um, and then basically that's what works. You just always check for that. So if there is a gas leak, again, if the um, readings are um, greater than the potential, like the threshold, then you should run that um, function for gas leak. And then the way the interrupt works, like we said, it is when um, the um, interrupt routine, when the um, interrupt pin picks up that rising edge, that's when you should run the flame detection um, routine. And then um, that's basically everything that we have. And then now going to the SMS, send SMS notification. The SMS notification is basically what we, what we want to do with that for the actual project 
is to um, trigger like an event using an online service. So we are using um, IFTTT, that's um, the if this then that applet so it's a, an online cloud service that you can use to um, trigger events and then um, send notifications so we configure this in such a way that um, you um, um, configure webhooks and then if that um, web, webhook is triggered then you should send um, the sms so uh, because we're not able to do that on Tinkercad, so we decided to simulate it by um, just um, serial printing something so um again for when a fire is being detected you send a message that oh fire um detected and then you um the method runs in such a way that we are getting um the parameters for the message and then a string type so that we can know whether it's a fire that is being detected or is a gas um that is being detected and then we basically try to check whether um a message has been printed out within the last say 10 seconds so because this also this method also runs in an interrupt within um the delay function doesn't really work right so we decided to just use the melee function to count the time um since the program has started so once we count the time we get the current time and we check for the type and if it is gas then we check whether the current, um, the last message time, the last gas time, like the time, the last time the gas message was sent yeah. was, and minus the current time is greater than 10 seconds. So like the span is, um, the difference is 10 seconds. In the real world, probably is like 10 minutes or 30 minutes. But if it is greater than 10 seconds, then you should serial print the message which says gas detected. And then you should set the last gas message time to the current time that was picked up. If the same thing for fire too, if the the this um the duration between the last message and this message um the current time is ten, then you should print it out. If not, then you should not send a message. So that basically simulates the idea that oh, if um fire fire is detected and it triggers the web hook, then you should check whether um the um the um, time interval between the last message that was sent and then this current time is ten minutes or something, and then you should trigger the event that sends the sms notification we'll show that later but now we can um basically show how the code works on the on tinkercad and then explain um more further if need be wait let me just put this here so to run the code we have um we can do this start our simulation and then because for some reason, Tinkercad, um, the timer, the simulator time counts really slowly. So it's counting in milliseconds. So we have to wait um, to have at least maybe like 10 seconds or something. Or we can just change the time. We can change the time to maybe two seconds so that we can easily pick up the gas detection instead of waiting 10 seconds to, for it to print out. So we check for every two seconds and see whether it's actually um, detecting something within that every two seconds. So now we are running our code and when you check the wheels, you can no you notice that the robot is moving forward, forward. because it is, everything is positive, positive, then the mm -hmm. values are basically the same. And that's because when you check where this uh, object is for this ultra um, front sensor, it is above 80 centimeters, it is 213 centimeters. So if you move the object closer to less than 80 centimeters because of the timing it takes a little while for it to actually pick it up so because of once you have like that it is currently in 61 centimeters then it reads and then tries to print out wheels turn right and it's yeah. printing out wheels turn right because the distance for the side is greater than one, um, 70 centimeters which you can see here that is 174 so if we decide to move this robots to uh, this object to less than um um 70 centimeters it takes a while for it to pick up because of the simulation time but it will also show that the wheels will turn left so just um wait a bit for that to pick up and then we can continue yeah so now we show that the wheel has turned left because it has actually come within like that um within the um the range that we set so to see so now we can also test our oh looking at the wheels turn left we can see that for if, when it is turning left this the wheels of, of the left turn um stop to zero within the delay time that we put within the delay time that you put it turns to zero and these wheels are in full, full speed but for when it 
turns right this is to, um this is stopped it turns to zero and this is in full speed so um that's basically how the, we, we were able to confirm that the um movement routine actually works so now to check for the um simulation um simulation for interrupt so if you press a button on this it will simulate the presence of a fire let's clear this and then because our simulation time is past two seconds i would not send any message before so when we trigger this our our stop runs and then it prints out the message that gas fire detected. This takes a bit of time to stop because it's, it keeps running. <laughs> like, yeah, so it stops and then it doesn't detect. Right now, if we try to post it, um, trigger again because the time is not within um, two seconds, it will not print out the message again. It's until it passes two seconds that it will print out the message again. So the same goes for um, the um, gas um, for the gas so if we turn this to over 512 it would it sh it's supposed to also pick up the um, wait <laughs> let me put so that's basically how this one works and then the gas also um, also picks up when you are when it gets turned to the left and the right like that so that's how the uh, admin um, macro version of the code works we're also able to implement um to optimize it to the um arduino um to the register manipulation version and then why does that take time to so we can talk about um the register manipulation now and um my will pick that up so we have our um sorry so um our enable pins Use this. <laughs> sorry <laughs> our enable pins and our input pins for, for the motor drivers are connected to five six seven eight twelve three sorry just so 12, i 13. yeah um what 12 13 12 13 yeah that's what I, okay i said 12 3, 3. <laughs> sorry 13 and then for our trick pins they are connected to um the analog pins so a4 a5 a1 a0 so in our setup we set um we set this ddrd for the port d pins ddrb for the port B pins and DDRC for the port C pins. So I'm going to show you on um, the schematic diagram for the Arduino Uno and our data sheet, yes. just how, just the logic of that. Okay, thank you. Um, so for pin five, <laughs> thank you. We can see that's port three pin, th I mean port D pin three, pin six port D pin four, pin seven port D, what is it? Yeah. Yeah. Pin seven. Put D pin six. Yeah. Pin seven is put D pin seven, seven. actually. Yeah. So um pin eight is put B pin zero. And then pin twelve, pin thirteen are all put put B pins. And then the analog pins are put C pins. Analog zero is put D pin zero one put D uh, put C sorry pin one analog four is put D pin what is it pin, pin four actually A five is put C pin five actually yeah. yeah 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 so those are the pins so we wrote those registers respectively to one because we're setting them as output. Not all though, because we, for our trick pins, okay, no, our trick pins are outputs. For our echo pins, we didn't write that to one because we're not, you know, we're leaving them as their inputs pins. So, yeah. So back to um, the, the methods we wrote for the movement of the robots. Um, so we left this as we writing the enable pins to the speed we wanted them to. Okay, so to explain how we converted our digital rights function in the macro code to the register manipulation version of it, I'm going to be using this um, move forward function here, these two ports. 
with this pot D is, is writing to input A, which is pin 7. And pot D pin here that's being referenced here is writing to um, P, um, driver pin 1B, which is pin 8. So from that, so 7 and 8, pin 7 and 8, pot D and pot B pins. So from the data sheets, we can see pin 7, which is here. Okay, yes, sir. That's PD7. And put 8, I'm sorry, pin 8 on the Arduino board, which is um, part B, pin 0. Sorry, let me say that. So for pin 7, which is part D, pin 7, we're referencing this um, pin of the it's register. This bit in the register, still in pin. But um, for part B, we're, we're referring to the zero bits of the register. <laughs> yeah. So part D. That's for part D. Pardon my handwriting. Pin seven and put D B sorry pin zero eight. So what we tried to do was we wrote for where we wanted to write um the pins to either zero or one. We're going to write zero to this and one to this. What we did is we referenced the port by saying port D, then we used a bitwise and. <laughs> okay, so for our port D pin, that's for the pin seven, we're shifting basically a pin zero to the seventh bit of the register, of the port D register, because you know, we're negating it because is is this code is basically saying shift spot one, the negative the you know, value negates the, yeah, yeah, value one shifts the negative of that to the seventh um bit of that register. And this is saying shift pin because um yeah, well, driver pin one is basically seven, driver pin one B is eight. But since this is a, an eight bit eight, an eight bit um micro register. register basically <laughs> yeah so we do the modulo eight so it gives you know the remainder as the actual bits pin so we shift the one to put b pin zero with this function so basically on what we have in our register would be sorry this for binary then we write one because this is the last bit that's um bit seven zero actually it's going to be zero because i'm writing zero to this eight times <laughs> then for our pin um for our pin eight on the arduino we're going to write or it's going to basically shift left shift that one bit to the first bit here so it's like eight um seven zeros then the last bit which is the first bit of the register will be written to one so that's basically how we that's the logic we use to to do the register manipulation so from that we can just see that's the logic we use for the rest of it where we wanted to write um zero we negated the one that was left shifting and where we wanted to write one we shifted just the one with a logical i'm um, sorry <laughs> with a bitwise and um, or sorry yeah so the code we have in our macro version is basically the code we have here with the register manipulation as i've explained how we the logic behind our register manipulation of all the pins 
for a uh, flame and gas detection error. We talk about the register manipulation, but so the remaining part of like the optimization has to do with the interrupt um, service routine itself. So for the macro version, you use we use the attach interrupt functions, which basically um, attaches the flame pin to um, it. It converts it to like an interrupt um, um, pin, and then when it triggers, when it picks up a signal on the rising edge or something, then it triggers the flame detection. So to convert that to register manipulation. Uh, we talk about um, the registers that are used for interrupts. So we go to the, um, we have our, we go to the data sheet and then we search for um, like, there are two, there are three registers that are actually being used for when you want to um, enable or like work with um, the um, pins as interrupts. So we have the IC, EIC, RA register, which is basically the control register that you use to um, set up the um, interrupt pins. So as it says here, like they are the control bits. Um, the Uno, uh, the Uno microcontroller has two interrupt pins, which is um, the interrupt pin two and three. Interrupt pin, um, the pin, pins on the board two and three. So those are the interrupt pins, and that basically translates to like in um, the first one is pin two and the first and um, the second one is pin three and we are using the um pin two which is the first interrupt pin as our flame um pin so um to convert that to um to convert that to like the register manipulation you um work with the icr i e i c r a register and we also work with the um we also work with the e i m m s k which is basically like the mask register. So how this particular code works is that since we are using the um, the um, first interrupt pin, which is the interrupt pin zero, aka pin two, when you check for the, in the data sheets, that particular part of the um, register, these two bits are what control the interrupt pin zero, pin two interrupt pin, which is basically pins um, bit zero and bit one of the register. The same thing for EI, um, MSK, e EI MSK. So for EI MSK, um, the interrupt pin zero, which is pin two, is being controlled by the bit zero of the EI MSK register, right? So when you want to enable that, um, when you want to enable that pin as an interrupt pin, you are making use of the bit zero and bit one of the EICRA register. So you are basically saying to enable that um, to enable that inter, um, that pin, you want to enable whether it's on the rising edge or the falling edge or whatever um, change that you are trying to make. So you can check for um, how to, can check the data sheet for how to enable on rising edge. Uh, so to, for you to trigger, um, to set the interrupt pin um, and to set a trigger for the interrupt pin. So like when it is, uh, maybe like it has like a low on the rise uh, on the rising edge, so like we have this um, bit zero and bit one of the EICR register. So for you to pick up um, signals or inter um, interrupts on um, a, on the low level, so when the value of that particular pin is on a low, you set um, the zero bit bit zero and bit one of the EICR register to zero zero. But if you want it to be any logical change, any form of change, you set only bit zero to one. But if you want to use falling edge, so like when it's going from low to high, from high to low, you use this um, combination. And when you are doing like from zero um, low to high on the rising edge, you use this combination. So because we defined our code to um, in the Arduino version to use um, rising edge, so that means we want to set both pins, um, both bits. Of that EICRA register to one one, so which is basically why we are doing a bitwise shift here. So what this part of the code says is that do a bitwise shift of one, do one one shift one zero times. So when you have like your, when you have like your um the binary representation of one is in zero 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 um seven zeros and then one. So you, with that part of the code says that do a bitwise shift left zero times. So basically shift one into bit zero of the EICR register. Then you also have this part that says, um, do a bitwise shift of one to one, shift one one time, which is basically shift one, yeah, which is the bit one 
of the EICI register. So you want to also shift to one here so that you end up with zero 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 five zeros and then one one. So the, this value of the EICI register tells the compiler, tells the board that, oh, you are enabling the interrupt pin zero, which is um, pin two. And you want it to pick up changes on the rising edge by setting these two bits to one one. So this does a bitwise. This does a um, bitwise also. Like it's when it does this conversion, and you have that zero 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 one, and then this one gives you zero 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 one zero. When you add that together, you get zero 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 one one, and that is the value of the EICR register. So now, what the mask basically does is it tells you to unveil. Um, you know, it tells you to unveil that interrupt pin to be able to be that pin to be able to be used as an interrupt pin, and that is done by using um, the EIMSK register. And when you use the EIMSK register, the bit zero of that register is what unveils bit um, the pin two to be used as an interrupt pin. So you do that by unveiling and then doing shifting a one to that part of the bit. So you have zero 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 one at the EIMSK register, which basically tells it, oh, you want to use the um, pin two as the interrupt pin, and then you do that. So this particular function also um, basic, um, it initializes or enables the interrupts. So when you go to the data sheet, you can also search for that function, and that helps you to know that, oh, you use the, S so yeah, the e e SCI um, function is a global interrupt enable. So it's basically telling the, um, the board that oh you want to enable interrupt pins but you want to ensure that interrupt pins are enabled for juice so that's basically the conversion of the attach interrupt function what goes on behind the scenes when you are um, using the attach interrupt function and then this is the, also the register um version of using serial begin so we did this because we simulated our sms notification um in um by using serial print statement and this basically also works the, by um, you have your UCR OB register. You um, the part of the code um, the you want to the part of the code that you want to work on like the UCR. Let me just let me just show that. So you have your UCSR OB register, and you want to ensure that you you shift. You want to ensure that um, you enable um, transmission. So you enable transmission by using the um, txen um, txen variable and the txen variable is bit three of the UCR UCSR OB register. So when you search for that, you can always see here that bit three of the UCR OB register is the inter um, the transmitter pin. So to enable trans serial transmission, you use this part of the code and you convert. You basically shift one into the third bit of the UCR SR OB register and that um, enables serial transmission so like you're able to transmit data out and then this is just the board rate register to set the board rate to um, um, start serial communication so this is basically this is the conversion for serial communication and that is everything that that's basically everything yeah. once this is done you have your isr routine that actually runs when um, the um, flame pin picks up um, any um, the I change so this is an inbuilt ISR routine so this ISR function is like an inbuilt function and then because we are using the um, interrupt pin zero we are using interrupt pin zero so that calls the interrupt pin um, zero vector so like this particular function is an inbuilt function and then we basically just add the same code that we used to trigger um, stopping the robot, the toner, and then sending the SMS notification. And then the SMS notification is still just basically um, conversion of, it's just um, um, normal um, arithmetic. So Okay, so the next part we're going to move to is the examination of our memory usage and overall memory, memory analysis. So here we have both our macro and um, register version of the code, register manipulation version of the code. So from the, the macro version, we can see um, that the sketch is, basically what it said, it uses 3% of the program storage space. That's and, flash memory. Yeah, that's flash memory. And 3% of the dynamic memory. Yes, Ram. Yeah. So, and from our um, um register version of the code register manipulation version of the code we can see that the flash memory is reduced to two um, percent and 
yes, yeah, six thousand four hundred and fifty-eight bytes, and that's two percent of the flash memory and three percent of the SRAM, which is not significantly significantly reduced due to our uh, usage of the serial print lines. So if we remove that, we'll see that the should we remove it here. Mm. We can see that the memory usage in the SRAM is significantly reduced. Okay. I'm going to remove all the statements. Yeah, so if we just remove this and then we try to run the code, we'll see that it actually reduces the SRAM by a lot. Yeah. So it's this 3 bytes to 3 10 bytes now. Yeah. And then we are even, it also, it also reduces part of the yeah. um, flash memory too. True, true, true. Yeah, yep, yep. So next, we're gonna talk about our uh, um, memory analysis. dump. Yeah, SRAM analysis with our memory dump code. Let me open it. So this is the memory dump code, and then we run that on our just run it, and then we because we have to pause to be able to like explain the bits that we want to explain. So the SRAM is divided to the data dot BSS dot stack and dot heap. So the dot data refers to um, variables that were initialized that the in, declared and initial, initialized at the beginning of the code. So are you gonna run it? Mm. So once we run this, wait, okay, no, I've not called it. Okay, I've not called it. So we can call it anywhere at any point of the um. Any point of the code, depending on wherever, whatever we want to print in the stack, but we can always call it, we can call it here, so that we can just see what prints out initially when it is running just the normal routine of um, move forward. So yeah. Okay. okay. So from the results, we can see that um, on the first line we have. Um, five, six, seven, which are basically these pins that were the hexadecimal okay. equivalent of those pins that were initialized and declared at the beginning of our codes. We can see going through it. So 13, yeah, thirteen, a four, a five. Values. Yeah, these are the values in hexadecimal. So Ara is going to talk about the then, BSS and stack. Then the dot BSS parts, we have like variables that were only declared and they were later initialized in the part of the code. So the main, the two main ones that we can actually spot right away are the left wheel speed and the right wheel speed, which we initialized here to 120. And 120 in hexadecimal is 78. So that can be clearly seen here that this is probably like the, the start of the dot BSS part of the code because mm -hmm. we have the 78, 78 and then like other um other from other variables that we later used and initialized along the way in all of the code were also shown. So we can also um we also have like the stack um version which is the stack part of the SRAM that um contains variables in functions and interrupt routines and mm -hmm. because of where we called um this memory dump we can just run through the um when we run through it and we can see that like it keeps the code when we run the memory dump it keeps running running because like there's a lot of space in between the heap so there's really nothing in the heap that is um the heap is not growing towards or the stack is not growing towards the heap and the heap is not growing towards the stack so there's a lot of space based on like the memory um and usage analysis that we already done we could see that there was a lot of space that was being used and then we finally arrive like at the end of the stack so from the, the memory could do pass. Uh, the memory could have stopped running because like this is the end of the stack the part of the stack and basically what happens in the stack is like for variables that are initialized or like the uh, initialized or used local variables variables that are local to like um the um the functions or the entire routines all of the values are stored here when the um the um board or like the compiler um, the controller branches into these functions so we can clearly see that by say for example we decide to um, call our memory dump function within another function so you know like the normal routine that the um, board runs or the code program runs is to move forward right so we can decide to call the memory dump code inside move forward and maybe initialize say for example like a variable so if we call if we declare just the random if we stop this and then declare like maybe like another uh, method that or 
not even declare another method if we decide to run the memory dump code inside move forward instead of here we we'll just copy and cut this out and then go into the move forward and then run memory dump here but we also want to show that something is actually um, happening so we can see for example we can um, initialize maybe like this um like a variable to know where this variable actually is being stored and to confirm that it's actually being stored in the stack when it gets um called so so to test the um memory dump code inside the um, move forward function we can um make this setup run only once right because we will also want to see because if we keep keep it inside the while loop it will keep running the move forward so we only want to run it once to see if that variable is actually being stored in the stack before it ex exits and gets out of of that loop so if we run this simulation now um we have our move uh, we already have our memory dump code inside our move forward and we've initialized this variable inside our move forward as well so when it runs the memory dump code and it gets to like the end of the stack we would see that this variable is actually being stored in the stack as opposed to being initialized maybe with um the dot bss the um variables or the data. dot data variables so um yeah so this signifies the end of the stack right and we can clearly see that apart from there's apart from like some other variables that have been called um that that is running in the code based on like we are branching out and you have to save some of these variables that is being used that is going to be used by the um by the controller later you can clearly see this new um addition here so like this particular variable was initialized and stored onto the stack because the comp um, the controller has branched into the um into the function and because it's branching into the function all variables that are related to the function or the internal routines or anything else that needs to be stored before it um, exits that function to go back into its main routine all of that will be stored onto the stack and a clear example is this particular um this particular variable so that basically how the sram works or and how like um the um program runs what where the variables are being stored in the sram and um all that other stuff so mm -hmm. yeah that's mm -hmm. that's concluded